awards, including the Lowick House of Printmaking Grant, the Autumnal Fund Grant, and the Margaret Hall Silva Sculpture Foundation Grant. He is in numerous public and private collections, and he is currently represented by the Richard D'Amato Gallery in New York City, Perimeter Gallery in Chicago, William Habu in Denver, Colorado, and Sherry Levy Contemporary Art in Kansas City. So I'm very pleased and happy to welcome Jeff Bailey. Hi. Uh, what I'm going to do to start off is uh, I like to show some landscape images and just talk a little bit about landscape painting. Uh, not everybody's familiar with it, and you know I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of it. Uh, I'll always start these things by reciting something and asking if anybody knows what it is. I cannot bear to take my children into the forest and leave them, for the wild animals will surely devour them. Does anybody here have any idea where that comes from? Come on, there must be somebody here. Oh! <laughs> How much trouble has everybody, everybody had hearing me so far? Do I need to start over again? Okay, is that better? There you go, dearie. I can't tie a tie either. <laughs> uh, I normally talk a little bit about landscape painting before I get going and uh, I always start these things by asking, I'm going to recite something for you and find out if anybody here knows where it's from. I cannot bear to take my children into the forest and leave them, for the wild animals will surely devour them. Does anybody recognize that? It's a story you've all heard. You got it. Very good. Yeah, it's out of Hansel and Gretel. And the reason that I always use that is because in the tradition of landscape painting, for Europeans, it, there really was no tradition in it until pretty late in the history of painting. Uh, landscape and the idea of wilderness were really completely alien to European sensibilities. Uh, the wilderness was where bad things happened to you in the past, especially in Europe. You know, people lived in towns and villages and cities, and that's where they wanted to live, and living in the countryside was dangerous. And if you lived outside of the countryside, you were in very deep danger. It was really dangerous to travel from one place to another. It was really dangerous, the weather, I mean, you know, you had no easy access to shelter. And as a result of that, you know, in, your, in, in Christian theology, you know, the weather and nature have always been problematic. You don't really even get the idea, I mean, for almost 1,500 years, it was accepted that, that there could be no presence of God in any form in nature. Nature and especially weather were considered to be controlled by, by the devil. And there was not any real interest in them. Now, around about 1480, you have Giovanni Bellini. And this, this painting for me is very, very important. It's called uh, St. Francis in the Wilderness or St. Francis in Ecstasy. It's in the Frick Collection in New York and it's hanging up all the time. You can go there and see it. And it's in a room that only has five paintings on it. And it's, it's probably my favorite painting in all of Western art. And in it you have, I got this nice laser pointer here. 
St. Francis. And if you actually see the painting in real life, it's what it depicts is St. Francis receiving the stigmata. He has the wounds of Christ on his hands and on his feet. And what's happening in the painting is you have this grotto back here, this dark space. And back there, that's where his bed is. That's where he goes to sleep and he dreams. And what does he dream about? Well, God talks to him in his dreams. God talks to him in real life too, according to him. And when he comes out of that cave from his sleep, he studies and meditates at this desk. And what does he meditate on? Well, he meditates on death, he meditates on the Gospels. You see down here at the bottom of the desk are his clogs. They're very simple wooden clogs. Now, St. Francis was the son of one of the richest men in the world at that time. His father was a cloth merchant, and he renounced everything. He gave it all up to serve the poor and destitute. Now, the reason that the clogs are here is because he's, in the painting, he has to be barefoot because he's receiving divine knowledge from God. Where is the divine knowledge coming from? Up here, right down to him. You have that tree is even bent. And the divine knowledge that he's receiving is that God is present in everything. It doesn't matter if it's the plants, the rocks, the donkey, the heron. There's a shepherd back in here. It's kind of hard to see because this is not a really high resolution image. But he's recognizing that God is in everything. And that's a revolutionary idea in European painting. Now, in most European painting, once landscape gets accepted as something that can be depicted in painting, which was basically in the Renaissance. When you see landscape represented, it's almost always in terms of civil, civilizing influences on the landscape. So even though it may be wild, you might have all these interesting rock formations, the trees, the grass, you're always gonna have evidence of man's presence in it. And man moving out into it and taming it and putting it to God's purposes. Now, that's a very European way of looking at landscape. Now, the Dutch were really the first to pursue landscape as a subject in and of itself. But the Netherlands is almost completely man-made. It's drained marshland. And when you spend all that time working to actually make land to live on, then you tend to be interested in, in the land as a possession. And the Dutch, all Dutch landscape painting, you will always find evidence of human habitation. It's about painting stuff, stuff that you own. Now, this is uh, Johannes Vermeer, the Dutch painter, uh, view of Delft. And to me, this is a really good example of that. I mean, he wanted to paint his hometown. He wanted to do it in the context of landscape. And for me, this is a really beautiful example of landscape painting. But always, you're going to have evidence of human habitation and the civilizing influence of God on man in it. And that was a prevailing form for almost 300 years until the beginning of the 19th century, when you had the development of the Romantic movement in painting. Now, it's not just in painting, it's in poetry, it's in prose writing, uh, and there are a lot of great Romantic artists, but one that I look to for landscape that I think is very interesting is the German painter Caspar David Friedrich. And he was the first guy, in my opinion, 
to really pursue landscape as just pure artistic form and just to depict the land. Now, his, he was deeply religious, or mystically religious, I should say, and as with a lot of Germans, he had a very didactic streak in him. And he felt it was his duty and obligation to instruct the people that would be viewing his paintings as to what kind of experience they were supposed to have when they were looking at the paintings. As a result, almost every single painting you find by Caspar David Friedrich always has the equivalent of these two figures in it. And those two figures, their, their modus operandi is that they are witnesses. They're meant to be instructive for you, the viewer. They're giving you a clue and a cue as to what your experience of looking at that landscape should be. You know, these two are in very deep contemplation of the very ideas of, that I was speaking of with Friedrich. You know, this idea of the divine presence in nature. Now, in American landscape painting, you start to see some changes. There's a very different attitude in American landscape painting than in Europe, European landscape painting. You know, for early American artists, the idea is that landscape is no longer viewed as a complete threat. You have wilderness, you have the unknown, but it's, it represents opportunity more than anything else. It's something that you can go out into, you can possess, you can civilize it, and you can break out of the former economic straits that you were into and make money and build a better life for yourself. This is Asher B. Durand here, who painted the painting, and this is Thomas Cole, the father of the Hudson River School of Landscape Painting. Now, in my opinion, this is probably the first real uh, contribution that America makes to the world of painting is, is landscape painting. And Cole is the guy that is really at the rock bottom of that movement. Now, Cole was Duran's teacher, and what's happening here is basically it's Cole telling Duran, Sonny, boy, one day all of this will be yours and you will carry on my ideas. And Asher B. Durand here is telling us, hey guys, this guy is really the sh and he's my buddy and uh, he's passing the baton to me, Asher B. Durand, future very important person. Now, in Asher B. Durand and in almost all of the Hudson River painters, the one thing that you always see when you look at landscape is there's always that same sense of the witness. Sometimes they're in the middle ground like this, but with almost every example of great American landscape painting that I can think of and that I've seen, there's always evidence in the foreground or somewhere prominent of people that are having the experience of seeing the landscape itself and it's meant to be instructive. Now, when I started painting landscape and thinking about landscape, one of the ideas that occurred to me was that, you know, I don't really want to have a witness in my paintings. That idea doesn't really interest me. I would prefer to eliminate that completely, and as a result, I thought, Compositionally, how would you achieve that? Well, you'd eliminate all evident, all, everything out of the foreground of the painting. Anything that gives human scale to it, anything that indicates human presence in it. And foolishly, I thought, wow, that's a pretty original idea. I'm a very clever fellow, until one day I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and I saw this painting by John Frederick Kensett. And as you will all notice, 
the thing that is really striking about this painting is, oh, I'm sorry, no foreground, none whatsoever. It's as if the painting starts in the middle ground. There's nothing to give you scale or perspective on it. And what makes this unique is that it makes your eye, when you're looking at the, at the painting, function the same way that a camera does. There's nothing that separates you and the experience, his experience of having seen the thing. You're right there as if your eye is his eye. Now, for myself, you know, I try to keep all this stuff in mind as I'm painting, you know. I try to be aware of the history of what it is that I'm doing and how I fit into it. And, you know, some real basic questions when I started doing this was, okay, what, what is it that makes my experience of this stuff different than a guy like John Kensett? And for me, the very obvious reason is that the body of, of knowledge of how this stuff actually works is vastly greater than it was 100, 150 years ago. We know very much more about the world that we live in, and we know a lot more about the cosmos that we live in. And this knowledge is increasing very, very rapidly. And as a result, you know, I look at a lot of painting for inspiration, but one of the things that I look at more than anything is uh, this Hubble ta Space Telescope photography and satellite photography, maps, uh, digital imaging, all that kind of stuff is really, really interesting to me. You know, if I'm going to go out and paint something, I like to know what the processes are that make it the way that it is. Now, this photograph here was taken by the Hubble Deep Field Telescope. And it's a, it's a special camera that was installed in the Hubble that was designed to make photographs of the blackest part of the night sky. So what they do is they point the telescope into an area of the sky that appears to be completely black. There's nothing in it. And they stabilize it, and then they take an exposure. Some of them last up to two weeks, where they're just collecting individual photons that strike that, the, uh, the chip that it captures images. And when they process the images on those black parts of the sky, this is what they found. And these are galaxies that formed roughly 12 billion years ago. This is about as far out to the edge of the universe as you can possibly see, and as far back in time. You're looking at a photograph here that is, everything in this is as it appeared 12 billion years ago. And that to me is just flabbergasted. <coughs> And you know, they're making an effort now to start mapping all of these galaxies, their positions, and trying to figure out how all that matter is distributed in the universe. Now these are pillars of gas, and they're, what they are is they're star nurseries. They're dense clouds of gas, and if you look very carefully, you'll see there are areas where you have star formation happening. Now these things are huge. You know, this, you know, th these are light years long. The reason that you can see them like that is because we're so far away from them. But the light from that star there would take literally years to get to that star there. And the thing that really strikes me about these is these forms are familiar to me and probably familiar to you. Don't they look like other stuff that you've seen? I mean, I spent a lot of time in the ocean and in the water, and I see this kind of, of, of form in nature in the water all the time. They're very, very common. And uh, that to me is really striking, you know, that you'll see something this huge that occurs on a really small scale. Now, these are two galaxies merging. 
Now, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is currently moving towards the Andromeda galaxy and will eventually merge with it, much the same as this galaxy here is. And you see, you know, the spiral form and it's in the remains of another one here. Now these have passed through each other and they will eventually recombine into a single galaxy. But that spiral form is happening in nature all the time. I see it as a landscape painter and a guy that goes out and looks at it and photographs it. I see these forms in the sky all the time. That is a hurricane. An essential, oh, I'm sorry. What did I do here, Laura? I turned it off. There we go. You know, you're looking at something that is, you know, probably 100,000 light years across from end to end, there to there. And there you have essentially the same form on a scale of hundreds of miles. That's Hurricane Rita from, I think, a couple years ago. But these are the kinds of things that interest me and the kinds of things that I tend to look for when I'm collecting material to paint. And you know, the way that I do it, I mean, I grew up in an age, I'm 53 years old now. And when I was a child, I, my parents, had cameras, my grandparents had cameras, and I grew up in the age of Kodachrome film. And as a result, I have probably the most complete documentation of my childhood that you could ever possibly imagine in these Kodachrome slides. And I know for all of you guys, a thing that is fundamentally, completely, absolutely different in the way that you live every day from the way that if not your grandparents and your great-grandparents lived, is everything that you think and feel and remember and dream has been affected by the way that you take in information. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I dream, very often they have a very cinematic quality about them. You know, because I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movies and hours of television, and as a result, it affects the way that I think about things how I put things together sequentially in my mind. You know, and this is a way that we form memories now. Photography cannot be separated from the process of memory for any of you. I mean, you guys all, I bet every person in this room right now has a phone with a camera in it. And I would be willing to bet that probably sometime during this day, you're gonna be shooting a photograph of something. And you'll save those photos on your phone and if you don't end up deleting them, eventually those photos will be a part of the process of you remembering things. You know, it just, there's no separating that out. I mean, we're beyond the point of no return with that stuff. And I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. I think it's a very useful tool. But for me, it's a big part of the process of how I go about making my paintings. I mean, I tend to take long driving trips. I'll say, okay, I'm going to go to Santa Fe, New Mexico, but I'm going to stop in Denver first and I'll get in the car and I'll start driving. And I have no idea what I'm going to find on that drive. I just start driving. Now there are certain times of day that I'm more interested in than others, but generally I'm just out there to see what happens and, and to look for specific kinds of things. And what I'm looking for is anything that gives some kind of an indication of the relationship of the macro to the micro, the small to the very large. You know, it's quite astonishing to me that these forms that you see here, you know, where you're talking about light years from one end to the other, you have that in your body right now, your cochlea is exactly that form that gives you your balance. You know, all of these physical processes in nature happen in both the macro and the micro. This is the first of my paintings. Uh, 
for a long time, I was specifically interested in, in weather. And I would go out and photograph thunderstorms and any kind, of, any kind of extreme weather that I could find. And as you can see, you know, always in my paintings, there's nothing in the foreground, ever. And I do that very specifically because I want, I'm trying to get it to look as close to the actual look and feel of what it was like when I experienced it. Now, for me, a photo photography is an aid in that, but it's, you know, I, I use photographic source material, but, you know, I'm making paintings, so I'm not, anytime that I'm out photographing things, I always know that I can make alterations to, to make them into what I consider to be a good painting. You know, normally, I'm, I tend to reduce things. I tend to take things out, to strip it down, to try to get it as close to a feeling of something elemental or essential as I can. This is an area just to the south of the village of Galisteo in uh, New Mexico. Now this is, it's about 20 miles from Santa Fe. Santa Fe would be right over that mountain, right about there. And this is a spot, uh, Galisteo would be right over in here. It's on a main state highway and you come out of the village and you go up a series of hills and it's a view uh, that takes in the Sangre de Cristos, the tail end of the Sangre de Cristo mountains. And I just love this view. Uh, this particular spot has four different views in it and I probably painted this view here oh, 30 or 40 times easily. Uh, and I really like it just, I like the view because it's so stripped down and it's like a stage for everything that happens with the weather and the light. So every time I'm out in that part of the country, I always go out to this spot at the end of the day and see what I can get. And, you know, all these forms in the clouds, I mean, they happen in everything. You find them everywhere. I spend, I live in Hawaii in the wintertime and I spend a lot of time in the water. And I am always noticing that whenever you have breaking waves, when the foam dissipates, it always, it always follows these same kinds of forms that you see in skies. You know, the air is, in a way, another form of a liquid, and the land is also. It just moves much, much more slowly. And one of the reasons that I like this area is because it's been relatively geologically stable for a long time. And there are forms in the land, curves and sweeps, that echo the same stuff that you see in the cloud forms. That's the same area. That's the same place. Did you have what scale are these? Uh, this one here is 34 by 48 inches. And this one here is 48 by 72, 4 by 6 feet. It's a big painting. Now this is right across the road at the same place in New Mexico. I guess the thing, uh, my teacher when I was in art school told me one time that uh, he thought that light and atmosphere were something that I had a natural affinity for. And, you know, I, I think it's sort of interesting that that's pretty much where my interests have taken me over the years as a painter. You know, those are the things that really fascinate me. This is an area very close to Galisteo also. Uh, this was a very odd phenomena that happened. Uh, I've only seen it happen once. Uh, I made the trip from Galisteo, which 
is the village would be over here and we were way over here in a town called Cerrillos. And we'd gone over there to visit the shop and while we were there, there was a big hail storm that came through and it dumped probably two or three inches of hail on the ground. And the hail rapidly melted. But as we came back on the road back to Galisteo, it was late, late in the evening. And uh, the sun was almost down. And the closer we got to Galisteo, the closer we got to the, to the thunderstorm that was dropping the hail. And that's what this is. It's hail falling. And what it did was the whiteness of that hail picked up all that gold yellow tonality from the sun going down. You know, the sun was way off this way and very, very low on the horizon. And it made this really strange kind of gold light that was just in everything. I've never seen anything like it and haven't seen anything like it since. This also is uh, close to Galisteo, New Mexico. Those are the Santa de Cristos back here. And this is a little bit unusual for me just because it has you know, some of this more dense vegetation in the foreground in it. You know, normally I won't do that sort of thing. But to me, when I saw it, it was just very striking, that strange kind of purpley blue flower just going through it. This is in Kansas, and Kansas is an area that I spent a lot of time in. There's an area in the, uh, sort of the eastern part of the state that runs from north to south called the Flint Hills, and it has the same kind of real elemental landscape, and I've spent a lot of time out there over the years. Uh, I went to school at the Art Institute in uh, Kansas City, and my parents were living in Denver, so I would have to take that, that trip in the car between Kansas City and Denver on a regular basis and go through this area. I've been going through it now for 30-something years. And uh, just never get tired of it. It's really beautiful. This is also Point Hills. Did you say the Flint Hills? The Flint Hills, yeah. Now, you know. Is that photo just taken from Sethi? It's not a photo, that's my painting. <laughs> right, but when you shoot the photo. Uh, no. Very often, very often, uh, when I'm out there, I'm driving around on some really rough roads. It's ranching country, and I do you know a lot of a lot of traveling off the major highways. I, I have nothing against major highways. I mean, I've shot lots of stuff and painted lots of stuff that's right off the interstate. I love the Kansas yeah, it's it's really beautiful. You know, most people think of Kansas as not being very attractive, but there are parts of it that are just absolutely gorgeous. And it's probably at this point that I should talk a little bit about. Uh, you know, I don't teach for a living. It's, uh, I never have. I am a full-time painter. That's all that I do. I just paint. Uh, and I show in a lot of different galleries, you know. That's how I make a living at it. Uh, it's, it's a very different, I mean, I don't know, as young design professionals for you guys, uh, you're all in, I guess, the, the first year of studying design, two-dimensional design in this class. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just always feel obligated to say <laughs> that, uh, you know, you guys should be ready for a long haul professionally. You know, it takes a long time to establish yourself. You guys, if you're going into more design-oriented occupations, will have an easier time of it than, say, someone who's a painter or a sculptor. But uh, it's a very competitive way to make a living, and it takes a lot of time to do it. Uh, you know, I'm just, I've been very, very fortunate in that the, the things that are really interesting to me, that I really like, and that 
you know, I feel driven to paint just happen to be things that other people like enough that they'll buy them. But, you know, that's a pretty, pretty lucky coincidence. It doesn't happen very often from what I've seen. You know, and, you know, in the world of, of, of working with, with gallery professionals and, you know, dealing with it as a business, you know, it's, it's a business. It really is a business. I mean, it has artistic aspects to it, but it's about making money. And, you know, I've been very, very fortunate in that respect to be able to, to make something that I like myself that, I'm, that somebody else will want to have for themselves. This is Flint Hills also. Uh, this painting is actually in the collection of the Denver Art Museum. They bought it uh, two or three years ago. But this is a little smaller. This is, I think, uh, 16 by 24 inches. And you can see, it, as they get smaller, the brushwork becomes more apparent in them. You know, I'm often told when people see something, that's 48 by 72 inches. And people will say to me, oh, they look like photographs. And I'm always kind of a little puzzled by that because, you know, having painted them, <laughs> I know that they're, they're actually, there's a lot of brushwork that's visible in them. Uh, but the smaller they get, generally, the more visible the brushwork becomes. Ten minutes, Jeff. All right, we'll start to wrap this up then. This is Colorado also. That is Kansas. And uh, in answer to your question, that's right off I-70. That's stopping the car on the side of the highway. This is also New Mexico. That would be the Flint Hills. And this is kind of uncharacteristic for me. But, uh, you know, I like it as a painting, so I, you know, I put it in with these just because I think it gives an idea, a little bit more of the idea of the variety of stuff that I do. Now, I also do a fair amount of portrait and figure painting, but I'm not going to show you any of that stuff. I haven't shown any of it. It's just something that I do for myself periodically. But water is another big interest of mine. This is uh, northern Wisconsin. Both of these are large. That's 48 by 72. And that also is 48 by 72. Both of Wisconsin. That is the Mississippi River front right directly across the river from Memphis, Tennessee. Looking into Arkansas. And it's very large. That's uh, four by eight feet. This is uh, out in the Hamptons on Long Island in New York. This painting actually got used as a magazine cover for an art magazine. That also is uh, out in the Hamptons. And both of those, this one is 34 by 48, the other is 24 by 36. Now, as I said, I live in Hawaii during the winter time, and I've done a lot of paintings of seascapes and, and paintings of the ocean. The waveform is very interesting to me, something that I really enjoy painting. These are just a, there's some installation shots just to give you an idea of what the work looks like in a gallery setting and framed up and hung on a wall. These are at Sherry Leedy Contemporary Art in Kansas City, Missouri. And that's what the pieces look like when they're framed. Now this is a small one. This is probably <coughs> 10 by 14 inches. And as you can see, they're, they're a lot rougher, the small ones. I still, 
I do a fair amount of small work every year. And I think it's, I like to let people get an idea of what they look like when they're framed out, you know, for presentation purposes. But you know, sometimes I think for me, it's just a matter of, you know, I'm interested in all of this as much as I can know about the processes from science that are involved in all this stuff, but sometimes it's just, you know, it's the pure impulse to make something that's beautiful. And, uh, you know, for me, that's still a very, very viable thing to pursue as an artist. You know, other people, there are some people that don't think so, but you know, I, I am not one of them. And that's it. You guys probably won't want to hear this, but uh, as students you should know, the one piece of advice I can give you is make a lot of stuff. You gotta work and work and work. When I'm, I live in Hawaii three months of the year and I don't paint at all, but when I'm at home, I paint a minimum of 10 hours a day, seven days a week. And if I have a show going, it's usually 12 or 14 hours every single day. And if you guys want to get any good at it, that's the recipe right there. Work really, really hard, make a lot of stuff. And I wish you all really good luck. I hope you all get famous and make tons of money. <laughs> Thank you.